Welcome to Authors in Conversation at Home with the Evelyn Rubenstein JCC in Houston. We're so glad that all of you have joined us tonight to hear from Houston's own Bettina Elias Siegel, author of Kid Food, The Challenge of Feeding Children in a Highly Processed World, and the popular blog, The Lunch Tray. We had planned for Bettina to be joined in conversation tonight with Zibby Owens, but unfortunately, there's been a death in Zibby's family. We send our deepest condolences to her and want to thank Helena botmiller Evich for stepping up this evening. Helena is the senior food and agriculture reporter for Politico and has received numerous accolades for her reporting, including two James Beard Awards and the prestigious George Polk Award in journalism. I'm Donna Gershenwald, past JCC board member and member of the 2020 Book Festival leadership team. I am particularly honored to introduce tonight's program as a proud friend who has watched Bettina's growing influence on how parents and policymakers understand the complex issues related to how we feed our children. We are so thankful for the continued support of our community. This program is supported by the Evelyn Rubenstein JCC Patrons of the Arts, a grant from the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, and the Maurice Amato Foundation. Tonight's program is being broadcast coast to coast and is in partnership with Congregation Emmanuel in Houston and JCCs of Boulder, Dallas, Miami Beach, Nashville, PJ Library of Cincinnati, Scottsdale, Seattle, Staten Island, and Tampa. It is our hope that you will continue to enjoy our Authors in Conversation series from the safety and comfort of your home. Next week on September 9th at noon, you can join us to kick off the high holidays with a Rosh Hashanah cooking demonstration featuring blogger and influencer Danielle Renov, live from Israel. And on Sunday, September 13th, you have the opportunity to hear from William H. Groner and Tom Teicholtz about how on September 12th, 2001, thousands of responders banded together for the benefit of a city, state, and nation. During tonight's program, you'll hear from Bettina Siegel, whose voice is changing the landscape of health and nutrition for children across the country. In Kid Food, Bettina explores one of the fundamental challenges of modern parenting, trying to raise healthy eaters in a society intent on pushing children in the opposite direction. At the end of the presentation, we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A feature, which you will find at the bottom of your screen, to type your questions. We will try to answer as many audience questions as possible. We will send you a link following the presentation so you can purchase a copy of the book through the Jays website. Thank you for spending your evening with us, and please join me in welcoming Bettina and Helena. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm uh, happy to fill in where needed uh, for this wonderful event. I'm glad to hear so many of you are joining from all across the country in you know this weird world we now live in, where we have events on Zoom. Um, I am really honored to be here with Bettina, uh, my friend. I have known Bettina for almost a decade now. I realized recently it has been almost a decade. Uh, I first uh, got to know Bettina, um, I think it was back in 2012 when she had launched this massively successful viral petition online to get uh, lean, finely textured beef, which most people still know is pink slime uh, out of school meals. And this was really a, a massive cultural moment. I mean, there was a real tizzy in the media. A lot of people were talking about this. Uh, and Bettina and I have, have kept in touch ever since. And her, her blog, The Lunch Tray, has just been a tremendously influential uh, platform in the food space. So I, it's been great to keep up with her work uh, for, for all these years. And I thoroughly enjoyed Kid Food. Everyone should buy a copy after this. If you have not already, I uh, I read this actually as I was expecting my first child uh, in the fall, and gave me a little bit of trepidation to be honest about what uh, what I have in store for me. Um, my my son is eight months now, so he's just now eating solid food and hasn't yet hit food marketing. But we will talk about that. Um, it's really a great book. I learned so much, even as someone who covers food. So highly, highly recommend. It's a it's a great read. It's really fun to read, and it's also incredibly interesting. So. 
couldn't, can't recommend it enough. Um, Bettina, I want you to just start off by telling us a little bit about how you got here. How, why did you write a book about kid food? You know, just tell us a little bit about, more about your background for those who aren't familiar with your story, because you come at this from a, an interesting um, perspective and sort of life path. Yes, well, thank you for that, first of all. And yes, this was a very unexpected path for me. Um, I actually am trained as a lawyer and I practiced law for about 10 years in New York City. And I quit the law when I um, when we had our first child. So I, um, you know, never saw this career coming. I was actually trying to be a freelance magazine writer. That was my goal. Um, but around 2010, um, Donna Gershenwald, who just introduced us, um, actually told me about a committee that was forming here in Houston um, and it was gathering parents together to try to improve our school food menus. And at that point, our school food was really quite subpar. Um, and so I joined that committee with her and the things that, that we were learning about school food were so unexpected and, and troubling to me um, that I actually took it upon myself to like go home and read about it and learn more about the program. And the more that I learned, the more my whole attitude about school food shifted. I went from being, um, you know, just almost like angry at the people serving this subpar food to our kids to actually feeling incredibly emp empathetic toward them and understanding all the obstacles they were facing. And so um, that alone might not have been enough for me to start the lunch tray, but also just as a parent back then, I had an eight year old, a 10 year old, and I was finding that raising healthy eaters was very challenging. And I never expected that that would be a challenging part of parenting. I, I had a picky eater. He wasn't eating any vegetables. You know, I was really worried about his diet. Um, I was surprised at how influenced my kids were by food marketing. I felt like many adults in their daily lives were putting junk food in front of them, you know, without my even knowing about it. And, and any one of those treats really wouldn't have bothered me. It was just kind of collectively starting to add up. So those things together really led me to start the lunch tray, um, which I did in 2010. Yeah, and you really like learned, you know what, you go like deep into this industry. You, you mentioned that a lot of um, people might not realize that the, you know, school lunch is so, it's such a complex system. It's like, I always say it's a $23 billion industry that no right. one really talks about. So I, I'm really <laughs> glad that you like felt the need to dive into it because it is a really unexplored topic, I think. Um, so, so before we get too far into this. I mean, the, the subtext, subtitle of your book is The Challenge of Feeding Children in a Highly Processed World. For those um, in the audience who are not super steeped in this world, right. what do you mean by highly processed? Like, what are we, what are we talking about here? Just, just for the convert, you know, to kind of ground the conversation. Right. So when I started writing Kid Food, the very first thing I did was write this um, introductory note. Like, here's what I mean by highly processed food, because I feel like, you know, if you're too loosey goosey about it, like people will say, um, you know, don't eat anything you can't pronounce, you know, that's actually not true. There are some things we can't pronounce that are perfectly benign or even good for us. Like most so, vitamins. Yeah. But right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I really, and, and then you kind of open yourself up to criticism. Like this person doesn't know what they're talking about. So I was kind of casting around to try to find a really good definition. And what I wound up using um, is, a, is a definition created by um, a researcher um, and advocate, I guess you'd say, in Brazil named Carlos Montero. And he's invented what's called the, the Nova classification system. And so what he's done is he's um, divided foods into four categories, like the, you know, category one is minimally processed whole foods. And then you go all the way to category four, which is what he calls ultra processed. I call it highly processed. And it basically, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's somewhat complex, but the idea of it is it's foods that are you know, generally low in essential nutrients, generally have quite a bit of salt, sugar, fat, um, and often are made of ingredients that we would never find in our own kitchens, you know, soy protein isolate and things like that. And then also use, use um, products that are themselves refined, like refined white flour and, and things like that. But the thing that I really liked about his definition also is he built into it um, all the other factors that lead us to overconsume these foods, like the fact that they're advertised aggressively, that they tend to have health claims, and that they tend to be marketed to children. So I, I use this definition, and, and as I was writing Kid Food, actually, right around that time, a lot of studies started coming out that really showed these very powerful correlations between consumption of ultra-processed food, as defined by Carlos Montero, and all kinds of diseases. So just to give you an example, you know, looking at a population level, they would find, 
you know, for every 10% increase in consumption of ultra processed food, you have a 10% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And they were finding that kind of correlation with a lot of different diseases as well as obesity. Um, since the book came out, and I'm, I know you're, you're really familiar with this as well, this researcher named Kevin Hall did this incredible study. It was like this gold standard study where he had um, a, a group of adults agreed to live in isolation for, um, for a solid month. And for two weeks, they ate a whole food diet. And for two weeks, they ate an ultra processed diet as defined, you know, in this Nova system. And he, he was, you know, he calibrated the meals perfectly. So everyone was getting the same nutrients in both diets and the people participating actually liked the food equally, whether they were eating the whole food or the processed food. But when they went through that two week period of ultra processed food diet, they typically were eating 500 calories more a day. And of course they gained weight during those two weeks. So, you know, the, the, the point of all of this is there really is something, we don't even fully understand it about ultra processed food that leads us to overconsume it, that clearly is driving disease in this country. And I say all that and then want to share this fact, you know, at least 50, if not 60% of the American diet is ultra processed food. So it really is, quite problematic. Yeah, and side note on that study, which I always think is interesting to say, is it was the first, um, I feel like, randomized control trial that looked at processed food specifically. Yeah. Exactly. Like, that had not been studied, which is sort of an interesting um, thing to realize when, right. to your point, it is, <laughs> it is half, half the diet now. So um, I remember when that study came out and, you know, they're always like the first of its kind. And this was like, no, the first ever. Actually. Yeah, right. so, um, everyone should should read the, 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 the coverage of that study. It's, it's really interesting. Um, I, I was really interested to read about the history of kids menus. Um, it's something I see, you know, out out in the world. And I've thought about a fair amount with covering school nutrition and now, you know, having a kid. But I had no idea that it went, I mean, it's kind of tied to prohibition. Like if you go all the way back, like, I mean, t tell us a little bit about that and like that, what, you know, what you uncovered there. It's kind of surprising. And um, I don't think a lot of people know the bad I, I certainly didn't know. And I'm glad that you found it interesting too, because I'm such a food nerd, a food history nerd. I was, I was like, nerding out. I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about that. All right. So, so here's the deal. So I was trying to figure out like, what, what do we even mean by kid food? You know, like, and I'm looking at yeah. different ways, different metrics of that. And so obviously one of them is our current restaurant children's menu. That is a very good indicator of what our society currently thinks of as foods that are, you know, for whatever reason for kids. So then I had the idea, well, I'd really love to find out, you know, when did children's menus first come on the scene and what did they have on them? And so if you'd asked me, you know, going into that research, I really would have expected that whenever they showed up, it would be that era's kind of analogous, junky, delicious, fun food, you know, like, you know, especially because now we, we eat out a ton, you know, like 50% of our food dollars are spent outside the home. But, um, you know, in prior generations, going out to eat was like a very special occasion. So I figured it would be celebratory and you would just give kids whatever pleased them. So it's completely not that. It was completely, you know, the opposite. And what I found out was that, as you said, you know, prohibition was a factor. Because of prohibition, restaurants were losing tons of revenue. They wanted to appeal to- Because they make all their money on alcohol. Exactly, right. <laughs> Even right. today, I'm pretty sure that's still true. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, right. So, you know, so they want to, they need customers. They want to bring in families. And but this is so interesting, the moms of that time, so like in the early 1900s, 1920s, they are now getting really steeped in information about nutrition for all kinds of reasons I talk about in the book. And so they want, they want to go to the restaurant, they want to bring their kid, but they're worried that the food on the adult menu isn't healthy enough for their little child, you know, that, and they're learning all about nutrients and what they should be eating. So the restaurateurs created these menus that were especially healthy. So it's like, you just have to wrap your head around that. You know, like the, the entrees were like vegetable plates and you know, these like really simple little sandwiches and wholesome soups. It was like the exact opposite of today. And I think what is so um, powerful about that and also super troubling if you really think about it is we really have had this paradigm shift for all kinds of reasons where, you know, the, the whole ethos back then was we're gonna keep kids in this like safe nutritional cocoon until they're old enough to eat the unhealthy food on the, the adult menu. And now we're like, 
our menu is actually healthier than theirs. We can get a salad and they can't, you know? And so it really, it, it, it really shows we no longer are prioritizing nutrition. And now we're much more concerned with just pleasing kids, maybe keeping them quiet at the table, you know, all kinds of reasons have driven it, but it's, I found it fascinating. And you're, and you keep seeing restaurants like make pledges, you know, to, to, to update theirs or make them slightly healthier. And it's, it seems like the, the foods that are on them don't fundamentally really change that much. I don't exactly like they'll just, add like apple slices, right. which I think everyone, all the nutritionists will go, yes, that's great. You know, but, um, they don't, yeah, it doesn't seem like they really like veer away from like the macaroni and cheese and t and tater or um, tater tops and chicken nuggets and exactly. It's like these maybe different shapes of chicken nuggets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these token changes at the margin, you know. And there have been some improvements. I don't want to be too grim about it. Like they've like, changed. I think they've cut sodium and they've cut calorie. You know, the right. portions. Like there, there's certainly been like a lot of pressure to to make changes. Right. Um, right. But it's, I, I don't know that I've seen a vegetable platter, but I, I also, you know, I have a few years before that's, that's my life of, right. of fighting over the kids menu. Right. Um, so, so one of the things uh, you write about is this whole like divide and conquer uh, dynamic that we have in the food industry where, I mean, it's kind of like you, you try to get the parents and the kids to, to, to get on board with, I guess, wanting a food or, or convincing them they need to both, uh, look for that food in the grocery store like talk, talk a little bit about that like wh what the relationship is between like the parent and kid dynamic and right. all of this so you know obviously if we step back the ultimate goal of food and beverage industries is to get us to buy their products right like that's that, that's all they're in business to do so they, they really do approach the family unit in a kind of divide and conquer way typically so on the parent side what, what they are often trying to do is really kind of where, you know, you know, make it much more difficult for you to be a, nutri an, a nutritional gatekeeper. You know, they know you don't, you generally want to feed your kids healthy food if you're not giving them a treat, otherwise you want it to be healthy. So they're going to do everything they can to make you feel, you know, either really good or even just good enough, you know, about that product to put it in your cart. Somebody, after I wrote the book, gave me this expression I'd never heard before called permission marketing, which I thought was genius. It's like, they just want to oh. give you permission so you feel okay about it, you know? Like, you feel okay giving in. Exactly. Whatever. Right. Bands so, were made in aisle six. Yeah. Exactly. So they do that through a lot of different ways. And, and so, you know, one of my chapters, I almost have this like field guide to some of the things that they're doing so you can be a little more sad about them but you know just as a few examples you know these these claims on the fronts of packaging are almost always you know specious you know like if you see a claim you should kind of be on your guard until you really investigate so one example is like made with real fruit like that makes you think this has to be better than something not made with real fruit and in fact that's often not always but often just a just a fruit puree concentrate which is literally just a form of sugar a sweetener so in fact you know that actually has rendered your product less healthy um or or a lot of uh, veggie claims you know like you'll see these toddler snacks with kale and carrots but it's like minute quantities that don't contribute to nutrition you know all that kind of stuff um and i talk about other like advertising techniques that they use and everything but then also with parents with all of us adults there there's something else going on that i think is really worth thinking about for a bit which is what i call nutritional noise you know we are all, I think all of us tend to be very confused at times about is something healthy? Is butter good? Is butter bad? Are eggs safe to eat? Or are they not? You know, and a, a lot of that nutritional noise is created by the food industry. They want us to be a little off kilter. It makes their job a lot easier. And so, you know, I won't go into all of them here, but there are lots of techniques that they use. Um, one, one big one is industry studies. So they'll, they'll, they'll commission a study to study their product. And the goal is so that they can make a health claim based on the study. So like an example would be, um, you know, like uh, uh, Welch's grape juice, you know, enhances cognitive ability. You know, they've done a study and then they can make the claim. And there shouldn't, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with them doing that. It's just that um, there's a kind of striking tendency for their studies to come out their way. And when people aren't, you know, who aren't affiliated with the company do the same study, it may go the other way, you know. So that's one way they're just kind of muddying the waters. And, you know, another thing they do is they have these industry front groups that speak, you know, in the media and will question you know scientific studies that, that go against their their bottom line and then no one is telling you that these front groups
groups are actually funded by the industry. So that's what's going on in the parent side, like wear down the, the mom or dad so that they can't really be the nutritional gatekeeper they might want to be. And then on the kid's side, it's all about stoking demand. You know, they want, they want to unleash what they call pester power. They want your kids to bug you in the supermarket and bug you at home until you give in. And, you know, I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's really almost incomprehensible what the, the, the links they go to. They're spending, we believe, close to $2 billion a year just to market foods and beverages to your kids. That comes out to a quarter of a million dollars every hour of every day. It's an enormous effort. They employ brain scientists. They, you know, of course, license characters that your kids love. When they get older, they're licensing, you know, or they're getting sports uh, figure endorsements. So, you know, they're doing everything that they can to attract your kid to the product. And unfortunately, it really works. It's very effective. Kids start to form an allegiance to a product. It can happen as, in as little as a single commercial exposure. And the problem is the vast majority of ads that they're seeing are for unhealthy products. It's like 90% of the marketing they see is for unhealthy foods and drinks. So it's just a really troubling scenario. You know, wear, wear down mom and dad through pester power, you know, kind of seduce them with claims that don't really mean very much. And that, that I think is a big driver of our children's poor diets. And then on top of that, at the checkout, you have the candy, which I have watched so many moms like <laughs> be on a borderline meltdown because their kids are having a meltdown on right. the candy. And you're like, you've made it through the entire grocery store. Like you've survived. Right. This <laughs> and now at the very end of it, you made it to the finish line. The candy aisle. I always feel terrible. I'm just like, ah. so I'm, I'm sort of concerned about that. Hopefully, you know, I'm sure my child will end up being right. totally super crazed. Well, actually, um, you know, let me just interject there. That's actually a thing, healthy checkout. I, I, you've probably read about this. Like, yeah. there are stores. Although I've never seen one in the wild. No, no, it's true. But it's a thing, yeah. It's a thing. It's a movement. It's a movement. Yes, I think they're, yeah, they're, I think, is that CSPI? There's some, there's some advocates yes, yes, yeah. pushing for, like, Basic, and so to explain that, it's basically trying to convince retailers to say, you know, parents would really love to have, uh, or maybe not just parents, but anyone who would be sort of tempted by the Reese's peanut butter cups every time. They might right. prefer to not stand in line with, with the candy. I'm, I'm right. sure candy companies have a lot to say about that. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I know they do. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned the, about the noise, too. That, that is so true that, I mean, I get asked about that the most, I think you know, can I actually eat eggs? Or I mean, people are so confused because whether or not the science is changing a ton, the headlines are changing, right. the, you know, dietary guidelines have changed a little bit. And it's like, it's just so confusing. I mean, it, right. it, and I, I just want everyone in the audience to, to, to feel like, okay about that because I'm confused and it's my job. I've been covering <laughs> food for 10 years. and I still get confused. And I think, there is so much noise um, for parents, not just parents, but for everyone to cut through. Yes. So, you know, everyone should just feel uh, not alone in that. Um, I don't have an answer for, <laughs> for it, but, and I don't know that you do either, but you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very universally felt. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about, about school food. Um, you know, the lunch tray obviously was very focused on talking about this $23 billion industry that feeds about 30 million American children a day. Well, it did, I guess, before COVID. Um, you know, we went through this period of time with, with the Obama administration where Michelle Obama was um, really taking a lot of heat, political heat, for updating the nutrition standards. I'm sure most people in the audience um, caught at least some of that right. um, in the in the news. Uh, where where are we with school lunch now? I mean, a lot of kids aren't in school. They're doing to-go meals. Like, what is the state of, of school lunch, do you think, right now? Well, so, right. So, so first of all, yes, I do want to give the Obama administration their due. I mean, they, they made tremendous improvements to those nutrition standards. I also, though, always like to point out, um, it, you know, that was passed on a bipartisan basis and, and actually had been initiated by the Bush administration. Like, they got yeah. the ball rolling. So I always like to say that. because it's true. Yeah. You know, like I, Although at the time. <laughs> yeah, right. 
not acknowledge that that is what it is. Exactly. It, it, has it, was, become it became very partisan. Yes. But yeah. It's become but, super political, but I really feel like that's unfortunate because up, yes. until, up until that administration, um, it, it, again, it was a bipartisan issue and as it should be, like we all yeah, should They passed about. a bill routinely and sort of, yes. Exactly. Exactly. So just, I just want to get that out there because I, you know, as much as I admire her um, spearheading that, I just want to point out to anyone who might be on another part of the political spectrum, you know, this, this is a bar bipartisan issue. Okay. Anyway, so, so yeah, so huge improvements made and I, and I, and I never want to seem like I'm carping or undercutting, you know, those achievements, but I, the, the chapter I wrote in Kid Food about school food, obviously before COVID, um, talks about some of the areas in which I feel we still really could use some improvement. I mean, just overarching, going back to our initial discussion about ultra processed food, as many parents know, school meals often are heavily reliant on ultra processed food, heavily. And so that now that we know the potential harms of that kind of diet, that's obviously like kind of the biggest issue in a way in terms of nutrition. And, and, and the way that you could you could address that is through more scratch cooking. And that, of course, requires more funding, more infrastructure. You know, so and I talk about some other issues like we don't have a sugar cap in school meals, so kids can get enormous amounts of sugar right now in their breakfast. So, you know, I lay out some issues that I would like to have seen change. Of course, now we're we're facing an entirely new universe. And now I think school meals, you know, are we are seeing writ large what a powerful and important safety net program that that program has always been. I mean, of the 30 million kids eating it, eating school meals, you know, always it's been the case, two thirds are um, qualified for free and reduced price lunch. Um, so, you know, right now, I think is not the time to be quibbling around the edges. I think we just want to get kids fed. Um, you know, as you, uh, you know, we've talked about this, um, there was a push even even before COVID to try to make school meals universal, meaning it's just free for everybody. Um, and fortunately, our federal government has allowed that to be the case now and through, I guess, the end of this semester and hopefully through the end of the year, because again, the, the, the priority has to be just getting food into the hands of kids who really need it without the administrative burden of paperwork and all of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the childhood food insecurity numbers are, I mean, objectively bad. I mean, they've, they've doubled during COVID. And um, I know a lot of anti-hunger advocates are looking at this going, you know, cutting off this lifeline to a lot of kids. Like, you, I mean, it's pro we're probably going to see in the numbers just how clearly um, uh, critical that lifeline has been. And I think to your point in a way that maybe not everyone totally realized. Right. Um, exactly. I, I just read... Yeah. Uh, like 20% of families with kids are having trouble getting enough food for their children right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's just horrific what's going on. And, and, and again, this is an important lifeline. It's so hard, obviously. And we've seen so much creativity in districts to do these grab and go and, you know, deliver it to your car and, and school buses going through neighborhoods. I mean, it's just been like heartwarming and inspiring to see school food professionals like step up, even at risk to their own health. It's been an amazing thing to watch. Yeah, they, they are devising, they're having to run like three or four programs all at once on the same budget. They're running like the remote learners, the hybrid learners, the in-classroom learners, like some of these districts are doing so many um, options and you really, you forget about like how much work that little part of the system is to just right. keep kids fed during a crisis. So I think right. it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so d one quick thing on the on the school school meal side, though, and I know you talk about this a bit in the book, and not to squ squabble about nutrition, but one thing I think a lot of people are surprised by with school meals, le learning about them, is that a, a lot of the products that you'll see are the same brands show up in school meals, but it's like a healthier version. It's like a formula. It's a totally different recipe, like of Domino's. Right that's targeted and created exactly for school meals to meet the nutrition requirements. Like it might have whole grain rich right. crust, but it's still dominant. Like t talk a little bit about that. I think that just always surprises people and it's confusing to right. Right. Okay. So why, why do we have that? Yeah. Why do we have that? Good question. So, so those are what a lot of people call. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of that happening right now too, because those products are going into people's homes. Yeah, get reduced fat Doritos from your to-go meal, but you can't buy them. 
Right, right. So, so these, yeah, so these are called like copycat products. And just as you said, like Domino's is a great example. They've got this thing called Smart Slice Pizza that comes to schools, like delivered hot, and it's in the same Domino's box with the same Domino's, you know, napkins and tissue paper and all of that. Um, you know, other examples are like the chips, you know, like the Cheetos and the Doritos, lots of breakfast items. You'll see Frosted Flakes and Pop-Tarts. So, you know, a person listening to us would say, well, what's your problem? Like they have been tweaked nutritionally to meet the standards um, of, the, of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, the, the, the school food reform. So yes, be better that than not. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. But let's step back. So, so one issue, if we just want to again circle back, like we, that is the kind of ultimate example of highly processed food. And, and again, we know it's not so much that nutrient by nutrient issue. There's something about this processing that we are now learning is problematic for health. So, so that's really important to keep in mind. Like even if it's meeting, you know, sort of ticking off nutrient boxes, that is indeed highly processed food that we're offering kids. Now, a whole other issue, and this is really important to me, is the marketing going on. So, you know, a kid, a little kid is going through the lunchroom and they're seeing Domino's pizza being served to them. Nobody says to the little kid, hey, this is somewhat healthier than the Domino's pizza you can get down the street, or these Cheetos are a little bit tweaked from the ones in the supermarket. So instead, they're just getting this message from their school, a very trusted source, you know, and from adults that this is okay to be eating on a daily basis. And that is really problematic. And I do believe that's a huge part of why those products are in schools, because they're a form of marketing. They're allowed to use the same exact logos, Chester the Cheetah, Tony the Tiger, you know, and, and, and so that's a big piece of it too. It's like you're, you're kind of undercutting your own nutrition messaging, if you have any, by serving what looks to kids just like junk food. Yeah, and it's such a, uh, an industry, again, that just people are not familiar with. Like, yeah. I I can't remember, have you been to the SNA conferences, like the School Nutrition Association conferences? I mean, it's just fascinating. Like there's just whole, um, whole companies dedicated to like specialized school food products. And yes, just like that stuff. So I've never been. Really eye-opening, yeah. Yes, I wanted to go, but the fee is so prohibitive for me. And then they, they yeah. wouldn't have come as a press person. So I know. Well, <laughs> let's, let's do a little context there. Bettina has definitely been a very big um, truth teller, uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe tough on some of these uh, dynamics. So um, you know, they did not want me there. They did <laughs> not Maybe me. we're not. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that they let me in, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> uh, so go, go, let's go back even, even earlier to like young, young kids. I mean, I, um, you know, I'm a new mom doing the solid food thing. I mentioned, you know, it can be kind of tricky to figure out what you're, what you're supposed to do. What, what, what did you kind of learn about the, the even earlier ages and the habits that are forming and tastes and sort of like what we should be thinking about, you know, even right. before the kids show up to school. Yes. So I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not like a picky eating expert by any means, but I did feel like I can't write a book about kid food and not have a chapter on picky eating because I think this notion about picky eating kind of drives a lot of the ways we feed kids in this country. So that um, led me to really want to understand more about the science of, um, you know, how, kids form their early taste formation, you know, like how, how their palates start to form in infancy. Um, so one of the things that I learned that I found truly fascinating um, is this thing called the flavor window, which is a period starting around four months or so, going all the way to about 18 months, in which kids are like particularly receptive to, to new flavors. And, and the, they're most receptive actually at the beginning of that window. So when they're really tiny and maybe not even um, able to have, oh, uh, did we lose you, Helena? Oh. I think you're muted, Helena. So weird, you went dark. I don't know oh, if it no. was my end or your end, but you're fine, go ahead, continue. Oh no, you went dark for me, I, so okay. So did anyone hear anything I just said? <laughs> I heard half of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bore people by repeating myself. But anyway, I mean, basically, so yes, I learned some cool things about, um, about early taste formation. Uh, I learned about this thing called the flavor window. I actually learned that before from a, a wonderful book called First Bite by B. Wilson. Um, and it's all about like, there's this period when kids are particularly like open to new flavors and that parents can actually use that window to their advantage. So a few tips that I wish I'd known when I was offering, you know, the first solid foods to my kids, no one was telling us this. Number one, 
apparently if you start with vegetables before fruits, you can, that can really help expand kids' palates. If you start with the fruits, with the sweet flavors, they can get very hooked on the sweet and it's harder to get them to accept the savory. And I'll just interject there, um, you know, unfortunately the, the baby food industry, they tend to often mix fruit with vegetables. Like they'll sell you a pouch that says spinach, but it also has pear, you know, so you gotta be cautious about that. Um, so that was really interesting. Another thing I learned is that if you offer kids, um, you know, babies, lots of different of these savory vegetable flavors in quick succession, you, it's almost like an exponential benefit. And they, they actually, you know, that broadens their palate even more, apparently, according to studies. So that was really interesting. Um, and then another thing I learned, and, and I feel like sometimes I say like this, this is like my public service announcement for, for parents of toddlers. The flavor window will come to a crashing halt at some point and, and kids will start showing what's called food neophobia, which is like, a, like it sounds, a fear of new food. And, and so you have this baby who's been relatively, you know, easygoing and adventurous and suddenly they may exhibit kind of a much more fearful attitude and much more selective eating. And that is a normal stage of development. And if, if I had been armed with that knowledge and then my kids started seeming very picky, I would have just written that out, I think, in a much more relaxed way. Mm. But I didn't know that. And so I was quick to go, oh, no, I have a picky eater. You know, what do I do? And I probably changed the way I fed him and made all kinds of mistakes. So, so those are just a few of the things I talk about in that chapter. But, but I wanted to share the ones that I think are most useful to, to parents who are just starting out with solids, like you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, they do tell people now to like mix more or start with more vegetables. Um, yes. Good. I, I think, yeah, I think there's something to that. I mean, my baby will eat, you know, pretty much anything, but um, I'm fearful that that will change and that I will be right, right where so many parents find themselves. So um, we, uh, I want to invite the audience to, to send questions in. You can use the Q&A function. Um, so go ahead and, and submit things. I'm, some questions are already coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one. Um, this is from Anna Miller Goodman. She writes, for those of us that are well past the baby tasting window, what suggestions do you have for trying to get past those textures or flavors? Um, and I know you're, you're not a picky eating expert, but it, it, maybe some, if, I don't know if there's any other general tips about um, expanding children's horizons in that way. Right. All right. So, so again, I always like to stay in my lane, you know, like yeah. I, you heard my background, I'm a lawyer. Right. <laughs> we could talk about Instagram accounts that are good. If yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> so, right. so exactly. So, yeah. so in, in my book, um, you know, there's an appendix where I refer you to lots of people I think are awesome in, in exactly that, like, you know, really concrete practical tips on how parents can yeah. For example, my kid will only eat carrots and nothing else. Like how do you bridge them from carrots to like the next thing? You know, they're really talented people with, with training in this area on the kind of specifics. But one thing I do feel very comfortable talking about because basically every child feeding expert agrees with this and I really saw it in action in my own home um, is this whole thing about called the division of responsibility. Um, do you know about this? I don't know if you do. Um, well, you probably read about it in kid food, but, but there's this woman named Ellen Satter who is kind of like the, the godmother of child feeding. And she articulated this, this paradigm called the division of responsibility. And it's, it's so simple yet very hard to apply in practice, I think, especially if you're kind of a control freak like I am. Um, and basically what she's saying is that at the meal, you know, the, 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 in terms of eating, parents have some very specific responsibilities and kids have very specific specific responsibilities and we should not cross over into each other's zone. Mm -hmm. So what she means by that is you as the parent should be deciding what we're gonna have for dinner. You can offer choices, but they should be like within your parameters, not saying to the kid, well, what should we have tonight? You know, instead you're like, I'm making roast chicken. Would you like, you know, rice or potatoes as the side? You know, you, you can give choice, but within your control, you should be the one deciding you know, are we eating at the table and are we eating with or without electronics, you know, or is tonight a night we're going to eat at the TV? That again, should be your purview. Like your kids should not be getting up from the table and running to the TV without that being cool with you. You know, all of that is on your side, but on the kid's side, it should be entirely up to them whether they're going to eat anything on the table and, and you know, what they're going to eat and how much. And what, what she's saying is, is when parents jump over that line with any kind of like games, manipulation, pressure, take three bites and you can have dessert, you know, no thank you bites, all that stuff. It, 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 I know anecdotally that works with some families, but in general, that really has a tendency to backfire. 
So when you're worried about your kids not eating, it's very hard to just sit on your hands and zip your lip and just let the table be a place where they can kind of grow at their own pace. But that has been proven to be the better approach. And in my own family, when I finally learned to just lay off, my son absolutely, I saw growth, you know, when I stopped pressuring him. And actually, let me just share this one study really fast because it will, it will drill this concept home for everyone. Um, they gave a, a group of preschoolers like little cups of butternut squash soup, which was probably something most of them had never seen before. And half of them were just allowed to have it or not, whatever they wanted. And the other half, the teacher was instructed to say things like, finish your soup. Come on, everyone, try your soup. And then they polled them about the soup. And that latter group were like, oh, it's so gross. I'm not going to try it. Yuck. You know, so I, I want parents to remember that study so that they will believe in the division of responsibility. You know, there really is something to that. And it's, again, I've seen it in action. So that's my picky any advice. <laughs> Yeah, I think people like get really worried about, you know, are they getting enough iron or, you know, calories or whatever. It just gets, um, and babies actually, especially young kids, they actually have a very good um, governor for how much yes. they eat. Yeah, they, they self-regulate their own. And I mean, I am constantly floored by like how much my, my eight month will eat, but they won't eat past when they're full. I mean, they, right. they'll just stop and- um, right. It, and we, when, often I don't think give them credit for sort of the limits they set for themselves. Exactly. And when you're playing games with them, take three more bites, you might be overriding that beautiful, you know, in, inborn innate system of self-regulation. You're, you're essentially saying you might be hungry, but I'm telling you to take three more bites. I and mean, that's not, I think the message we want to send to kids, we want them to trust their bodies and listen to their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, it's, I'm, again, I'm like, oh, it's easy to say. I don't have a toddler. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Um, we'll do this again in a year and see where you yeah, are. <laughs> I might be like, oh, forget it. Like, yeah, um, we've got some, some good questions coming in. Um, uh, th th this is interesting. So COVID is, uh, Sherry writes, COVID has given me an opportunity to make more things from scratch, but it's, you know, it's time and cost and, uh, time and cost are things that, you know, get in the way of, of cooking yeah. from scratch. Are there movements to pressure companies to decrease the price of healthier food? or, you know, less processed things? Like, is there any like movement to sort of make that more accessible and sort of more convenient? Uh, Cause it, that, that's the thing about ultra processed food is it's just so convenient. Like right. how do you balance that, that part of it? Right, and, and, and I guess one thing I would say is going back to that thing we talked about at the very beginning, this, this Nova system with the four classifications. I mean, there are all kinds of foods that are processed that, and that processing gives us much more convenience, you know, like if, canned like a, tomatoes, yeah, like canned tomatoes, canned beans, you know, I'm not soaking beans overnight. I mean, maybe someone out there is, but I'm just getting my can of beans. It makes it so much easier for, for me to make healthy meals, taking advantage of like that kind of processing. You know, if it's easier for you to buy your bag salad greens and, you know, if, if you're not going to eat spinach unless you buy it bagged and washed, you know, like there, there are lots of sort of that kind of health processing that I think enhances and mm -hmm. our ability to serve healthy meals. As you know, probably better than I do, I mean, I think there is pressure, tremendous pressure on the processed food industry right now to clean up their labels, to clean up their products, to try to offer convenient, affordable, healthy products. The problem is it's kind of a tension, you know, if it's ultra processed, it's kind of become inherently unhealthy is what we're learning. And so that's, I think, the challenge of the processed food industry in the coming decades. And I think they know it keenly that that's kind of the consumer demand, but do they put themselves out of business or, you know, how do they do it? And so I think, you know, it kind of remains to be seen. Yeah, I always hope that technology will start like fixing some of these problems. And by technology, I don't mean like, you know, crazy ingredients or whatever, but um, you brought up packaged salads. And like the reason we can have packaged salads is because someone designed like breathable right. packaging because it the... I guess if it's not somewhat breathable, though, you know, the greens right. are just like no, rot. They have right. to breathe. Um, these are the, you know, fascinating things you learn when you're like way too uh, <laughs> into these fields. Um, but, but that's, a, you know, that I think about that. And I'm like, you know, those types of uh, innovations really make a difference. I mean, I'm sure that more uh, parents are even attempting to serve salads in their homes now just because you can buy it without having to like chop it and wash exactly. it. Exactly you know, all, exactly. do, all the, all the, the, the labor and the, and the time and the prep work that, that Sherry was talking about. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is a lot for sure. Um, so uh, one of the things that's interesting as well about the book is that you, you don't really talk about o- obesity um, or, early in the book. I mean, it's, it's, I think you said it was chapter seven. It's, it's further in the book. It's not a big focus. Um, right. Although obviously, you know, childhood obesity is, you know, a very, very big problem. Why, why not like have that big focus? And how do you think we should be talking about that? Um, how, how should parents be thinking about that problem? Right. I mean, so I made a really conscious decision when I started writing the book that I was going to wait as long as possible to, to use the word obesity. And, and I just felt, I did that for a lot of reasons. First of all, I felt like we, we are all so inured to these horrible statistics about childhood obesity. I mean, it really is a, tr- a huge health problem, but I think we're, we've seen it now for so long that we might just tune it out. You know, that's what was one concern. Another is a parent might open the book and be like, well, my kid is of normal weight. What does this offer to me? You know, and, and, and really what I'm talking about, I'm not trying to minimize the, the really serious health effects of excess weight gain in childhood, but we're talking about a much larger kind of nutrition deficit across the board. Like I I did my best to try to quantify what is the diet of the American child right now. And um, when the paperback comes out, I'll update it with new studies. But the study that I found was the American Heart Association, pretty reliable. They um, compared kids' diets to their healthy diet score and 91% of kids were eating a poor diet based on their score. And that's across all racial and socioeconomic lines. So I would rather we be thinking more broadly about nutrition, of which obesity is a symptom. Um, And I also would just point out there are kids of normal weight, but if they're eating a very highly processed diet, they could have, for example, internal fat on their organs that can cause all kinds of serious health problems. They could be having issues with their cognition, with their mood. So, you know, again, weight is a metric of this problem, but I wouldn't say it's the, the, the complete boundaries of this problem. Yeah. Yeah, and that that is it does sometimes get reduced to that, you know. Right. The, the stats are really um, a- alarming, but you know, it's. It, I think we're finding now with COVID, it's diabetes. There, there's so many other diet-related diseases that put you at just general greater health risk, and right. Um, yeah, that's yeah, true. You're, you're going to hear a lot more. I think we're starting to hear a lot more about like. The role of nutrition and general health and sort of the risk that we all are in and yeah yeah, it's not about weight it's about like the general health and sort of sustainability of of the country really um yeah i mean i but and and i would argue we're not even really talking about childhood obesity like you know at a at a national level anymore anyway so Right. Um, but yeah, but, but that, that, that may be a, a, I don't want to say silver lining, but a, a positive effect of COVID is that maybe it will, it will bring more attention to just our general fitness as a country and the fact that people who are carrying excess weight, who do have diabetes are at higher risk. We now know that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely seeing more linkages there. Um, we're actually seeing some really interesting things come out of Mexico. There's tr- tr- trying to ban junk food to kids. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think once the, once we get past this point of being in like an acute crisis situation and we're sort of being re- more reflective, exactly. I hope we're on our way to that, you know, I don't right. know if it's <laughs> right. next I year or what, right. um, it will probably be one of like the policy things that, that, that we I can hope do. so. I really hope so. Yeah. Um, so if anyone else has a question, we probably have time for one more. You can drop it in here. Um, Someone, um, oh, there's lots of really specific questions about ingredients and, and things, which we just do not have time to get into. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, there's a lot of really specific questions. I just want to em- emphasize as someone who is into food and also a new mom, there are so many um, resources on social media now that are like, you know, not that are legit, right? Like there's dietitians on Instagram, there's feeding experts on Instagram and they're at like feeding littles is a, is a great account. Kids eat in color with the, and they are so granular in their, um, in their advice. So I just want to plug that from me personally, because I get all sorts of tips and we could spend another two hours walking through allergies and intro, you know, all the 
the different things. So I know there's some questions about that. Yes, um, I want to I want to plug one too, which I mentioned to you. Yeah. Um, this woman named um, Melanie Potok who has one called My Munchbug. I have just been oh, loving yeah, you her told me about this Instagram one. feed. It's, it's My she, Munchbug. Yeah. yeah, and she's she's partnered with this. It's so cool. This doctor, a pediatrician, um, made feeding, cooking, gardening part of her pediatric practice. It's so cool. Like, like literally it's part of her building. People come and learn how to cook and everything. Anyway, she calls herself Dr. Yum and Melanie and Dr. Yum have paired together to write books. So that's another one I would recommend to parents for, again, you know, I, I'm not, we're not dismissing these like more granular mm -hmm. questions because mm -hmm. they're super important, but it, but it's probably better to go to that kind of expert for those, for those questions. Yeah. Okay. Someone wants to know, um, if you're going to write another, another book about food and if, if so, oh my what gosh. <laughs> yeah, let's end on that one. What's next for you, Bettina? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I will say writing this book was so much harder than I thought it would be. I was like, oh, I've blogged for 10 years. I will write this in my Yeah, city. and you know your stuff. So thank you. From a good place. Yeah. It was so challenging and kind of miserable at times. And then, but just like the analogy of like having a baby, I have forgotten the labor pains. I'm like, that was so fun. I want to do it again. <laughs> So maybe I will write another book. I don't know. Yeah. To be, yeah to well, be. well, good, good luck to you. I know we are just, um, we, I think we are just now out of time and I know they're going to put up another like ending sort of like slide. So I'll give them a minute to do that. But before that, I'm going to plug the book again. Everyone should buy it. Super, hey. super informative. Um, again, even if you're not a parent, you just know a new parent or a parent, I think it would be particularly interesting. And actually, even if you don't have kids, I think like we all have an interest in understanding how this works and like how kids are targeted. And it's a really interesting piece of like society and how our, our, our country works. So I think it's interesting for everyone. Um, and I highly Thank recommend you. you all get it. And I think everyone was sent a link in here, um, in the chat, the link to where you can buy the book. So check that out. And thank you all so much for joining from all over the place. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much Thanks, fun. Thanks, Donna, for the warm welcome. And I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thank you.